In this series on worldview, I have tried to do a couple of things for you. I've tried to define for you what a Christian worldview is. I've tried to help you understand how uh, America, the average person in America, responds to the Christian worldview. And then last week we talked about how 94% of Americans don't have a Christian worldview. So what is their worldview? And we talked about that and some very uh, disconcerting uh, conclusions that come out of that. But now what I want to do to follow, uh, to finish this uh, series up is I just want to talk about what's the Christian response? How do we live in this culture and make a difference? And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And here's the great news is we should know exactly how to, to, to work through this culture because both Jesus and Paul were raised and lived and died in a culture that was very anti-Christian. Um, the Roman Empire was a wicked place. It was an evil place. It was more evil and wicked than America today. Um, they did not take kindly to Christianity from the very beginning. Uh, Jesus died for His faith. Paul died for His faith. So they had a lot to say about how Christians are to respond in a culture that is anti-Christian. And as we go further and further that way, and trust me, we're going there, uh, we need to know how to respond. And so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to give you a lot of ideas and I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can. I don't want this video to get too long, but there's a lot to talk about. So let's begin by talking about uh, our roles. And our roles are given us by Jesus in the Gospel of John. And our role uh, in John chapter 13 verse 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So before Jesus died, He told His disciples, I'm, I'm going to give you a new command here, and I'm going to give you your identity that's going to set you apart from the world. And this is the way the world's going to know you belong to me. This is how the world's going to know that you are a Christian. Are you ready? How you love each other. Now, there's plenty of places in Scripture to let us know we're supposed to love everyone, right? We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to love people in the world. But he's specifically talking about how we love each other as Christians. And it's interesting to me because the world is looking. They're looking in at the church. They're looking in at Christianity. And they are asking themselves the question, even if it's subconsciously, is this something I would want to be a part of? We're living in a world where people are scared. They don't like the direction the world is going. They are frightened and they're looking for answers. And so they're asking the question, is Christianity the answer? And Jesus said the way they're going to come to make that decision is based on how the church treats each other. So my big challenge for you, because we could sit here all day and talk about if the church is doing a good job of that or not. And that's an immaterial conversation. It would just be negative. What about you? That's what I want to know. What about you? Do you love other Christians with an absolute love? Do you have their back? Is your love unconditional? Do you love and exalt other Christians so that the world looks in and says, wow, the way they treat each other, they love each other. They take care of each other. They have each other's backs. I want to be a part of that. And so Jesus says, that's your role and your function uh, in the whole idea of the kingdom of God and evangelism into the world. That's your role. Now, listen to what Jesus says the Holy Spirit's role is, which is very interesting. It comes out of John chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. He says, Now I'm going to Him who sent me, yet none of you ask me where are you going, because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away, because unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit who's called many things in Scripture, but here he's called the Counselor or Advocate. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, I think it's really interesting to hear this. He says, listen to what the Holy Spirit's role in this world is. The Holy Spirit's role is to convict the world of sin. So, let's just make sure we've got this clear. What's God's role in the world? He convicts of sin. What's my role in the world? Love people with supernatural, absolute unconditional love. Just pour my love upon people. If I love people through my love, the Holy Spirit can work and convict the world of sin. Here's the problem with the church, I think. I think we've confused our job descriptions. 
we think it's God's job to love them and our job to convict them of sin. So let, let's just talk about a real practical issue. When's the last time that you were talking to a worldly person? I'm not talking about other Christians. I'm talking about worldly people who don't know God, and you talk to them about their sin, or you mention their sin, or you go on a rampage about some sin that you don't like or you're uncomfortable with or whatever else, whatever agenda is going on in the world today. How much good has that done for that person? How many people have you led to Christ that way? I bet the answer is zero. In fact, when you take the Holy Spirit's job and begin convicting people of their sin and pointing their sin out, first of all, they already know their sin. God's doing that. That's His job. That's not my job to point it out. What's my job to do? Love them in the midst of their sin. And over time, I have seen this happen over and over again. If we'll quit trying to be the self-righteous judge that are pointing out the sin of other people and just love them where they are, you know what happens? Holy Spirit comes in and begins to tap them on the shoulder, and He leads them to Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I do not have the right as a Christian to be talking to my non-Christian friends about their sin. That's not my role. My role is one-fold. I love my non-Christian friends, and I love my Christian friends and have their back, so my non-Christian friends want to be a part of what I have in the church. That's my role. I'm a lover. I'm a lover of people. And then I trust the Holy Spirit. See, we have a trust issue. We don't trust the Holy Spirit to do His job. I trust the Holy Spirit then He'll use my relationship with that non-Christian to begin to tap on His shoulder and lead Him uh, to conviction of His sin and lead Him to Christ. Okay, So let's just take this off the table. Our job is not to convict the world of sin. Our job is to love them. Okay, Is that clear enough? So let's move on now to 2 Corinthians because there's a lot of metaphors or word pictures that Paul uses to talk about who we are uh, as ministers of the gospel to the world. And I love this first one because in first, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in a triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other, other the fragrance of life." You don't understand this metaphor if you don't understand where Paul's borrowing it from. So let me tell you a story about the Roman Empire. When the Romans would go into a nation and take over that nation, they would go to the capital city of that country, they would go down the main street of that city, and they would have a Roman victory parade. They would have Roman officers, they would have the Roman army in all of their best dress gear, they would have the big stallions, they would have the chariots to show Romans power. And in it, they always used a very special, unique incense that they burned during those parades. They never used it any other time except then, and it was a very pungent odor. And the reason they did that was, is for every Roman citizen, when they would smell that smell, they would go, oh, that reminds me that we are the most powerful nation in the world, and we just took another country. But if you're from that country, you smell that smell, that is the most terrible smell you've ever smelled because it reminds you of death. It reminds you of all the people that died at the hands of the Roman army. It reminds you that now you're not going to be free anymore. You're going to be a slave in this territory to Rome. And so it was the stench of death. Well, Paul is borrowing that word picture, and he says, uh, you know, uh, God always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. So Christ is having a triumphal procession, and there's this incense that's burning, and the incense is what? The lives of His believers, the lives of His children. So as I walk through the world in the triumphal procession of Christ, and I just live out my faith, and I talk about Jesus, and I talk about my faith, and I talk about how God's changed my life, and I, and, and I talk about what it's like to walk in Christ, there's going to be two responses to my life. One is going to be people who are Christians that love the fact that I'm out there talking about it, and I'm out there living it, and I'm out there talking about Jesus, because it's the smell of life and the smell of their future in heaven. But there's going to be worldly people that hate me for that. They're going to hate the fact I brought it up. 
They're going to hate the fact that I talk about it. They're going to hate the fact that I live it. And it's going to remind them of their own spiritual death. I never have to confront them on their sin, remember, because that's not my role. That's the Holy Spirit's role. But as I live my role of loving people and caring about people and telling them it's in the name of Christ and talking about Jesus and what He's done in my life, there will be a group of people that will hate me for it because I remind them of their own spiritual death. People pleasers do not make good disciples. If you're a people pleaser, you need to get past that because we walk around in fear as Christians not talking about our relationship with Jesus, which never enables to us to, act, uh, to, to interact with culture so that we can start spiritual conversations and make a difference. They've got us pinned over in the corner thinking we're supposed to keep our mouths shut because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's people pleasing. You're not out to please people. You're out to please God. And God says, I want you out there as a fragrance of Christ, talking about Jesus where you go. And you know what? Most people are going to love it, and some people are going to hate it. Doesn't matter to you. Doesn't matter to you. Because you have an audience of one. You're out to please God, not to please human beings. Now, he continues on in chapter 3 with the next word picture that I absolutely love. 3-2 you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. So here's what he's saying. The second metaphor is, I am a letter of recommendation for Jesus. Now think about what a letter of recommendation is. If I, if I want to get a job, I might send you... Uh, an email and just say, hey, I'm trying to get this job. Would you send me a letter of recommendation for the job? Well, if I ask you to do that, what are you going to do? You're going to write a letter that says, you need to hire Brad. He's the guy for you. That's what a letter of recommendation is. My life is supposed to be a letter of recommendation for Jesus, basically saying to worldly people, you ought to hire Jesus for your life because He is amazing. Now, how do we live out a letter of recommendation? We live with joy. We live with peace. We live with contentment. We live with faith. We don't get angry when other people get angry. And, and we don't let the world fill us full of fear the way the world is filling all the non-Christians full of fear. And we live in faith and we live in joy and we, we enjoy this life. And it's contagious. And when we walk through that and we're in the world with the non-Christians and the non-Christians are fearful and they're not doing well, but we are and we're full of faith and we're full of life, we're being a letter of recommendation saying, you need to hire Jesus because this is what He does for me and He'll do the same thing for you. And so that's what a letter of recommendation is. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives. The third one is in chapter 5 and it's being an ambassador of Christ. Listen to what he says beginning in 5.18 of 2 Corinthians. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. This is a whole lesson in and of itself. But listen to that phrase. We're an ambassador as though God were making His appeal to the world through who? Through me. Think about what an ambassador is. If I'm an ambassador to Switzerland, then what do I do? I live in Switzerland, but who do I represent? The interest of the United States. Well, I'm living on this earth, but I'm an alien here. I'm an ambassador here. My homeland is heaven with Jesus. He's my king, and I'm representing His interest. So God is going to use me to make His appeal to the world on why they should live with Him, walk with Him, follow Him. That's my role. And if you'll notice, He called it the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. And so what is the ministry? Well, it goes back to what we said in, at the very beginning out of John 13. I love people unconditionally. What's the message of reconciliation? I love you because Jesus loved me first. So I have the ministry and the message. Now, let me kind of pull this all together, and then we're going to add one more element to this. Um, but let me tell you a story. I have a friend who uh, a few years ago uh, was in a church. He was in a small group. 
he was working in corporate America and there was a guy in his office in his mid fifties at the time that was kind of the office grouch. Uh, nobody wanted to be around him. He was, he was uh, rude. He was cantankerous. Uh, he was not easy to be around. And my friend, who's a Christian, who really believes that in, in this, he's an ambassador for Christ, just befriended this guy and just said, I'm going to be his friend. I'm going to love him like Jesus loves him and see what happens. And so he just started loving this guy. And the guy didn't like it at all. Uh, my friend would go into his office. My, my friend would talk to him at the water cooler. My friend would talk to him in the hallway. And literally, it took almost a year to start breaking this guy down because he was so hard and so angry and didn't want anybody in that rough exterior of his. But as slowly as my friend just loved this guy, just loved him, didn't talk about his attitude, didn't talk about his sin, didn't, he just loved him. He just cared about him. And finally, this guy started breaking down and telling my friend about his life. His wife was dying of cancer. And he was working full time. And then after he went home, he had to be a caregiver for his wife. And he had to bathe her, and he had to do the dishes, and he had to fix the meals, and he had to clean the house, and he had to take her to her chemo appointments. And they had moved here from another city, and they had no one. They had no friends, they had no family. And so this rough exterior was because he was hurting so bad because his life was just absolutely out of control trying to care for his wife and do a job to make a living. And so when my friend finally got through to him, he said, I've got an idea. And he went to a small group and he says, I've got a friend at work and his wife is dying of cancer. Could we have somebody help take her to chemo? And let's go in every week and clean his house. And let's go in and bring him some food. And let's, let's help him do the dishes. Let's just help the guy where we can help the guy. So the small group took on this guy and his wife as their project. And it ended up melting their hearts. And they both came to Christ before she passed away. That's how we win the world for Christ. We don't talk to them about their sin. We don't talk to them about homosexuality or transgender. We, we, don't, we don't go all those places. We just radically love people. And when we radically love people, it will break down the barrier between us and them, and it will start a spiritual conversation. And when it starts the spiritual conversation and we interject Christ, then we have a chance to reach the world. That's how we're going to reach them. Not by a judgmental, holier than thou, let me tell you the truth about your sin. It will never work. It's never worked. It never will work. Now, let me add one more piece to this. We're going to go to second, uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter is a book on suffering. And part of what, uh, how we respond to culture to lead them to Christ is how we respond to suffering. I want to read you a couple of scriptures, 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live your lives among the pagans so that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of, uh, that He visits us. Did you hear what it said? They're going to notice our good deeds and they're going to accuse us of doing wrong. We're going to make them mad and they're going to persecute us. They just are. Now we're going to go over one more chapter to chapter 3 verse 13, 14. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good character in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for why you have hope in Christ. But do it gently and respect and good conscience. Why? so that when they slander you, they're going to feel guilty about their behavior. In other words, that's how God's going to convict them and bring them to their knees. So let's put this whole thing together, and then I'll close it out by reading a letter to you. So he wants me to be the aroma of Christ, right? What am I going to do? I'm going to love people. I'm going to boldly love people. But I'm also going to boldly love people in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to leave Jesus out of it. I'm going to bring His name up. 
It just means I'm going to be the aroma of Christ and the letter of recommendation, and I'm going to be the ambassador, and it's going to make some people very happy, and it's going to lead some people to the Lord, and it's going to make some people very, very unhappy with me. They're going to hate me that I bring it up. I, I could sit here all day and tell you stories of times where I've just brought up spiritual conversations with people and talked about Jesus, and it made them mad. They got really angry at me. But that's okay because that's who I am because I've also led a lot of people to the Lord through bringing it up. So can I have a few people mad at me and hate me for the sake of reaching a lot of people for Jesus Christ? Absolutely. But he says, here's what they're going to do. Because I smell like the aroma of Christ and they're reminded of their spiritual death, here's what they're going to do. They're going to slander me. They're going to slander my character. They're going to call me a hypocrite. They're going to hate me. They're going to speak maliciously of me. They're going to spread rumors about me. They're going to lie about me. They're going to try to take me out because they hate me. Now here's the key. Are you ready? This is so, so important for you to understand. At that point is the hinge point on whether I'm going to reach the world for Christ or not. Because what they expect me to do is respond in kind. Oh, well you hate me. You're speaking maliciously about me. You have no right to do that. And I come back at them in anger. Why do you treat me that way? You shouldn't talk to me that way. I can't believe you would say that about me. And they turn around and say, see, you're no different from me. When I make you angry, you come right back at me in anger. You're no different from I am. But at that same hinge point, when they are speaking maliciously against me and lying to me, when I respond in love to my enemies. Remember what Jesus said, love your enemies. Pagans can love people who love them. What sets the Christians apart is we love our enemies. So when I'm the aroma of Christ and it reminds them of their spiritual death and it really makes them angry and so they come after me and then you know what I do? Instead of responding in kind, I respond in love. And I care about them anyway. And I love them anyway. And I serve them anyway. Even in the midst of them persecuting me. That's when the Holy Spirit is able to convict them, 1 Peter chapter 3 and John chapter 16, and they're ashamed of their slander and they come to their knees and that's when the spiritual conversation comes and they say, who are you and why are you so different and why are you loving me when I'm hating you? That is the difference where Christians can reach the world for Christ. So let me close out with this. 2,000 years ago, there was a group of 120 Christians in Acts chapter 2 that were meeting and praying and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started this little thing called the church in Christianity. And within 200 years, they had reached the entire Roman Empire with Christianity. How did they do that? That culture was more wicked than our culture. It was more anti-Christian than our culture. They died for their faith. They were really persecuted for their faith. How did they do it? And you know what the answer is? They loved when they were hated. And it absolutely drove people to their knees and it changed the culture and the culture became Christian. Let me close out by reading you a letter. This letter is in the second century AD. It's to a guy named Diognetus who was a Roman politician uh, by an anonymous writer describing the life of these weird people in the Roman Empire called Christians that were taking over the world. And here's what he said. Christians are not differentiated from other people by country, language, or customs. You see, they do not live in cities of their own or speak some strange dialect. They live in both Greek and foreign cities wherever chance has put them. They follow local customs in clothing, food, and the other aspects of life, but at the same time they demonstrate to us the unusual form of their own citizenship. They live in their own native lands, but as aliens. Every foreign country is to them as their native country, and yet every native land is like a foreign country. They marry and have children just like everyone else, but they do not kill unwanted babies. They offer a shared table, but not a shared bed. They are passing their days on earth, but are citizens of heaven. They obey the appointed laws of the land and go beyond those laws in their own lives. They love everyone, and yet are persecuted by all. They are put to death and gain life. They are poor, and yet make many rich. 
They are dishonored and yet gain glory through dishonor. Their names are blackened and yet they are cleared. They are mocked and blessed in return. They are treated outrageously and behave respectfully to others. When they do good, they are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if being given new life. They are attacked by Jews as aliens and are persecuted by Greeks. Yet those who hate them cannot give any reason for their hostility. You want to reach our culture for Christ? Be bold. Be the aroma. And when the world comes against you and persecutes you, love them in return. And that love changed the Roman Empire, will change the American Empire, will change the world for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this teaching and the Word of God that is so practical for us. And help us to be the people you've called us to be, the aroma of Christ, the letter of recommendation, the ambassadors that are boldly proclaiming our faith. And Lord, when we come against opposition and they hate us and they persecute us and they talk poorly of us and they lie about us, may we love them in return, Lord. And may our love for our enemies turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.